Welcome. Welcome to uh, our message this morning. I pray that the Lord blesses our time together. And today marks the fifth uh, part of our sermon series that was entitled, uh, The Bible Doesn't Say That. This sermon series aimed to, uh, to counter a lot of Christian norms uh, when it comes to these quick little theology uh, blurbs. Uh, we, we, we talked about how the idea that if uh, God uh, is approving of your actions, that your monetary gifts will come up. We talked about how that isn't real. And we also last week talked about how um, because of your sin, you are suffering. And we realize that that's not always the case. Yes, our actions have consequences, but that is not the uh, that is not what Scripture talks about. Suffering comes even at the expense of good people. So, uh, if you have, if you're curious to hear these messages, you can watch them on our YouTube channel or in the video library on our Facebook page. I pray that uh, this message can be a blessing to you. Today, we're going to uh, we're going to um, object to the idea that. Uh, the idea that God won't give you more than you can handle. I'm sure you've heard this saying before when you're going through a difficult experience and people say, oh, God wouldn't allow this to happen unless I could handle it. Before we go any further on discussing this idea and what Scripture says, let's have a word of prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you guide and direct us this morning. I pray, Lord, that you bless the reading of your holy scriptures. These texts, Lord, are ancient, but you will make these ancient texts come alive and be uh, contemporary and be relevant to us today. So, Lord, guide and direct us, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I was talking to a patient at a hospital over the phone this week, and I was uh, I was talking to this person who is at um, the hospital, and due to COVID, many hospitals have gone away from uh, allowing people to visit patients. This is a very heartbreaking uh, decision to do because this this per this patient at the hospital was um, by herself. This patient at the hospital has been suffering from a chronic disease that is autoimmune based. This patient was talking to me as she is suffering, as she is alone, as she is sitting in a busy, busy hospital and very, very uncomfortable. As she was talking to me, she said, she said, Edgar, she said, it's true, right, that God uh, won't give you more than I can handle, right? And this idea really came up into my mind, and, and, and I was like, yes and no. God will, God doesn't bring suffering to us. God can take suffering and make something good out of it, but as we established last week, suffering, disagreements, cancer, all these, these things that, 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 that fill our lives do not come from God. They're not, it, it, God doesn't make these things happen so we can learn something good, <laughs> even though a lot of Christians believe that. I, as your pastor, I'm not saying that it happens. That the, the idea that God sends you something and that you can handle it, is, it, it has its limits. And that's going to be what we're going to discuss this evening. Excuse me, this morning. We're going to be discussing how God doesn't just send things towards you so you can handle it. There's, that's a misconception. So please turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. 
And this is what the scripture says, okay? Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God that is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in the, in the whole of Achaia, grace to you and pre peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We find that Paul is writing to a church in an ancient city called Corinth. We have this letter that we call a book today. We have this letter and we have Paul's uh, communication to this church. We have one side of the, uh, of the conversation. So when we read the scriptures, we need to understand what we know and what we don't know. And at this very moment, we have one side of the conversation. But any type of conversation with another living, breathing person is two-sided. So we're going to have to understand the, the, the context of what Paul is saying. So let's continue to read. As Paul is writing to this church, he is trying to support them and, and encourage them in their walk. A church should always be supporting each other rather than bringing each other down. A church shouldn't just be condemning the actions of the world, but a church should be leading others to know who God is, and by that product, that will be improving their lives. So Paul, Paul, Paul starts off the right way. He wants to support his church, right? But now he's going to get into the... This is the, 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 the greeting. Now he's going to get into the meat, into the beginning of the meat of Corinthians, of 2 Corinthians. Let's read in verse 3. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. We'll stop there. Quickly, Paul transitions in this letter and starts mentioning comfort. Starts mentioning this idea, comfort. So we find that in life, you are, you are either hurting or you're comfortable. <laughs> Typically, when we are hurting, we look for God. When we're uncomfortable, we look for God. But when we're comfortable, sometimes we stray away from God. And we bring this idea up because obviously the, 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 the ancient church in Corinth is experiencing some kind of struggle. It is no secret that it doesn't matter if you're a Christian or you are a, an atheist, that you will have struggles in life. Many people think that because they worship the God of heavens and earth, the, the God of the Bible, the Holy Scriptures, that they won't have uh, problems and obstacles. But sometimes I have found it to be the case that Christians can incur, encounter even more obstacles because we, know, we, we established last week that there is an enemy trying to destroy your life. So if you think that because you are a Christian that you won't have any problems, Think again, you may be at the center, you may be targeted in a, in, a, in a different way. But that's beside the point. The point is that everybody has struggles and problems. If you think that you don't have any problems or any struggles, you need to check your heart because you may be ignoring them or be ignorant, or, or, or excuse me, you may be ignorant of such things or straight up delusional. <laughs> So Paul goes on to talk about how in these few verses that, that, that God is there with the broken hearted. When you have gone through struggles, have you asked yourself, God, are you there? If you've ever been admitted to the hospital and you're recovering from a, an extensive surgery or you encountered cancer and you're going through chemotherapy or you've been divorced and you feel alone or you lost your job and you don't have any type of way to, uh, to, to, to buy the things that you need in this life, uh, have you ever thought to yourself while you're suffering, God, are you there? You're not the only one that has thought this idea, that has thought about this. 
But Paul goes on to, um, goes to describe to us in these few verses that God can give us comfort. God may not get rid of all our problems, but He will be with us and He will comfort us throughout any problem that we encounter. This is very key to us for us to understand because many times we may have this idea that, that we do not have any problems, that, that because we serve God that we won't have any problems. And, and, and when these problems smack us in the face, we're like, wait, this isn't supposed to happen. But the thing is, when we do have problems, God is faithful to be with us. And that's good news. You may be in your hospital bed during the COVID era and your family is not able to be with your loved one, but God is. <laughs> Isn't that good news? We know that God is with us when, we're heart, when our hearts are broken and we're never alone. May that give us some kind of peace and comfort. I've been in those kind of situations where I have, uh, there, there was nothing I could do about a problem and all I could do was ask God to give me peace. And God will give you peace. And when we gather together as a church, or rather um, either in online or in person, when we gather together, when we, when we come together, we don't just share with each other our problems, but we share how God has gotten us through our problems. And that, and that is a blessing to each one of us. Because there may be a, a test that you went through. There may have been an obstacle that you went through. And God gave you the energy and strength and peace in order to get through it. And then that experience is valuable to the church. Because someone else most likely will go through a similar experience. And Paul is going to go on to describe how that God is with us in our trials, that God is with us throughout our obstacles, and then we can share and encourage others when they go through such an experience. The church is stronger together than when it is apart. God is with those that are uncomfortable, those that are afflicted. And if you are a Christian, you can ask the Lord. And, excuse me, because if you believe in the God of the Scriptures, whether you are a church-attending Christian or not, God can give you peace. So this opens up the possibility for anybody. So I don't want you to think that only the, 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 the very active religious person is the one that... Uh, is the one that can only talk to God and is the one that God favors. But God favors anybody that is willing to give their life to Him. And God is willing to give you peace. Verse 5, let's continue reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 5. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experienced when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Verse 7, Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. Paul transitions to the idea that because Christ has suffered, He suffered on this earth, He can relate to your suffering. That God can relate to how you're feeling. That God is understanding of your situation. And through that understanding, that the church can come together and support one another. That when you are suffering, we are suffering. And that when we're strong, each, other's, of each, other, each one of us are stronger together. We find that 
Paul, through this one side of the conversation, is giving the church in Corinth the, the, the idea that God is there with us, and, that, and because God is with us, and we are, when we congregate, when we get together, we can support each other. We live in a highly stressful world. With the advent of technology, a lot of good things happened, but a lot of side effects as well. We find anxiety is at all time high. People are going and finding refuge in conspiracy theories. People are finding refuge in, um, in, in different uh, vices to try to cope with the stresses. But God is not saying you, don't, you do not need you do not need external material uh, possessions or ideas to comfort you. You need the God of the living word, the God of scripture to give you comfort in your life. We find that the church is meant to support one another. And if a church only adds anxiety it is, it, to, to the world, it is constantly working against itself. There are problems and there are obstacles in this world, but God is bigger than any obstacle. So, so don't just get caught up in the problems. Are you spending time with the God that's bigger than any problem? Let's continue reading to see how this develops, this idea of, of suffering and comfort. Let's, let's read verse 8. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and He will deliver us again. On Him we have set our hope that, we, that He will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer, so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessings granted us through the prayers of many. In verse 8, Paul transitions to a practical reality. Paul describes a situation where his life was threatened. We find that Paul doesn't say that life will be perfect when you have God, but we find that Paul is saying that he came to a position where he thought he was going to die. He thought that Paul, Paul thought that he wasn't going to be able to survive. He doesn't, Paul doesn't describe entirely what the obstacle was, but this was a mortal obstacle. This was, could end his life. And he goes on to describe that, that, that Paul had to rely on someone else, on God, rather than just looking at his problems. And that is what gave him the strength to go forward. We find that Paul takes this message that you may encounter a problem in your life that's going to cripple, you, that could end or cripple your life in a drastic way. And Paul goes on to say how God was able to use that experience and teach Paul that his that his success, that his ability to overcome situations does not come from his own strategic way of avoiding conflict, but it comes from relying on God to get him through whatever obstacle. Is this, is this clear? We find that Paul is more interested on how God is going to save him than interested in saving his own life. We find that Paul is giving us the counsel don't just think about the end times, right? As Seventh-day Adventists, we've heard of end times. As Seventh-day Adventists, we've heard of YouTube preachers that are saying, or ringing the bell that the, 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 the coronavirus, that the vaccine, that these are all things that are going to end the world, right? You've heard the, these preachers, and you may be a fan of them. What we find is when we focus on the problems, when we focus on these uh, made-up boogeymen, we find that we're focusing more on the problem than on God. And when we encounter problems that can overtake our lives, don't just be thinking about the problems, but focus on God that will get you through your problems. 
This is key for us to understand that Paul here says that even if Paul had died in this, uh, in this, in this uh, struggle that he had in Asia, if, 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 if Paul had died, that God still reigns and is bigger than any problem, even if you lose your life, because, here's the kicker, God will resurrect you when He returns. So whatever problem that you, that you encounter, yes, it's going to be scary. Yes, it's going to be uh, life-threatening and, and shake you to the core. But at the end of the day, there's no problem, even the problem of death, that God cannot overcome. God, even if you were to lose your life on this planet, if you were to die in a car accident, you were to die by contracting COVID and, getting, and having complications come from that, if you were to die today from a stroke or just randomly you were to not wake up, there's hope for the believer. And that's good news. That's very good news. As I was talking to this patient in the hospital. Her autoimmune disease is breaking down her body. Her organs are failing. But somehow, by God's grace, she is able to slowly recover. But have you ever been really sick? Even the best pain medicine doesn't take away all your pain. Even when the doctor says that you will recover, and you see recovery, so, um, you see it come so slowly. When you see that no one can talk to you, be there in person besides the nurse, and you see that the hospital is overfilled with patients during COVID, when you encounter this kind of situation, many people would say, Many people would, may rationalize that God will, won't give you more than you can handle. But we need to understand something. That yes, God won't give you more than you can handle, but it's not by yourself. Because wherever you're at, God can be there. And if we were to change that phrase, is that when you have God, when you have God in your life and you spent and you have that trust in Him, that yes, whatever problem you may encounter, that yes, you can handle it not by your own strength, but by God giving you the strength to go forward in this life. This is very true. This is really real. Especially if you've, if you have been in a life-threatening position or in a life-threatening situation. That with God, anything is possible. And that God can get you through any, any situation with Him. Not by yourself. Because you're not alone. So don't think about it. Don't think about you being alone. Let's turn our Bibles to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3, chapter, uh, cha excuse me, Daniel chapter 3, verse 8. Daniel chapter 3, verse 8. And the scripture says this, Therefore at that time certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. So they declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the, over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. 
Stop here. So we find this narrative. The narrative is of a man, uh, of three young men, uh, uh, three young men that are from Jewish descent. You've heard of them. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they are politicians in the grand uh, government of Babylon, the ancient ba Babylonian Empire. And we've heard about these three characters already earlier in the book. Of Daniel. But in Daniel chapter 3, we hear that, that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, is having um, a statue built entirely of gold, and at a certain part of the day, music will come up and people had to bow down and worship this statue. And then in verse 8, we hear that these three politicians that didn't feel, didn't believe it was right to worship an image. They are being told on. They're being uh, thrown under the bus. And Nebuchadnezzar, whether he knew it or not, is, 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 now being, is now realizing that there's these three men that are part of his government that aren't listening to him. King Nebuchadnezzar had a, a, a power, a, a control problem. And the people that are reporting uh, these three young Jewish men know that, that, that if there are people who don't worship the image, that they're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. So now we find that these three young men are now in a really big problem. I mean, if you go into a furnace, you are most likely, no, you will not survive. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew this. They knew that, that, that because of their uh, uh, protest against the, the command of Nebuchadnezzar, that they could die. One of the most sobering things in life is knowing that our lives can end. Especially when you're young, you think that your life is, you're kind of immortal, that you're impervious. But as you get older, you realize that aches and bruises and you see loved ones die, that you know, you yourself can die. And as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego realize this and they're okay with such an outcome. Let's see how the story develops in verse 13. Uh, then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sounds of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning fiery furnace. And who is the God that will deliver you out of my hands? We find a recap. We find Nebuchadnezzar is showing grace to his politicians. We need to understand that Daniel chapter 3 is, is right after a coup attempt, an insurrection against Nebuchadnezzar. And we find that Nebuchadnezzar it doesn't know who to trust, but yet he gives some grace to these, young, these three Jewish men. And he says, look, I've heard that you haven't been doing this, but if you worship the image and my gods now, you're going to be good. But if you don't, I'm going to throw you into a fiery furnace. We find that, 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 that Nebuchadnezzar is serious and he is willing to kill these three young men over not bowing down to this idol. Many people will think to themselves, or, or, or think to themselves, God won't give you more than you can handle. And it's true to this certain extent. It has its limitations. It's not true in its fullest form. But we're going to find that God will be with you. And because He's with you, you can handle anything that you come into contact with. Any obstacle that tries to take your life. Any obstacle that tries to cripple your life. 
verses 16 to 23. Excuse me, verse 19, uh, no, verse 16 says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if, you, but if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. We find that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say even, that we believe that God will deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we still won't do this. We find that, that the, these young, these Jewish men know that God won't leave them alone. But the reality is that God won't leave you, but you may still encounter a, a, a car accident that ends your life. My wife was telling me last, two months ago, one of her co-workers was driving here in Niagara County and was hit by another uh, truck and instantly died. And this rocked the, her hospital department. And this was uh, heartbreaking for the family. And the question is, is, is if, I, I don't know who she, I don't know who she, if she worshiped God or not, but when these things happened, and, 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 and good people, God-fearing people die, God is still with them even in their death. Because God, can def God will defeat death, because death is just asleep, and when the Lord returns, those in Christ will resurrect. So believer, so person who doesn't know uh, if they believe in God or not, you can have comfort that through whatever affliction, whatever problem that you're going through, that God is with you. And God will defeat whatever problem that you have before you, even if it leads to your death. This is a radical idea because we find out later in the story that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fire, right? Because they never worshipped. And in the fire, there was three, there were supposed to be three of them, but then we find a shadow of a fourth person. We find a shadow of a man of, of what the scripture says, son of man. We find that God incarnate pre-carnate, however you want to think about it, that God comes into the fiery furnace and is with His three men that were faithful with Him. Whatever situation you encounter yourself in, whether it's a fiery furnace or if it's a recovery of a, 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 of a life-threatening situation like the person that I mentioned earlier in the sermon, Whatever situation you're in, God is with you even when you are suffering, even when you feel alone. God is with you. God can take the mess of your life and make it a message to other people around you. God is bigger than any problem that you encounter. The end time movement, the end time church in Revelation is not just focused on conspiracy theories, isn't just focused on these, these ideas that constantly change in order to get people's attention. We find that the end time church is not considering, the, is not obsessed with the problems of the world. The end time church is following Christ wherever He goes. So you believer, do you follow Jesus? Do you spend time with Christ on a personal uh, uh, level? Are you spending time with Christ not just on Saturday, on Sabbath, or on the weekend? Are you spending time with Christ today? Because Christ is willing to be with you wherever you're at. You do not need to be in a church building in order to worship the God of the, of the heavens and the earth. You can be worshiping God even from a hospital bed. God will meet you wherever you are at. What do you tell someone when they don't have any hope of living a normal life? What do you tell someone that has loved a loved uh, that that has lost a loved one to cancer? 
What do you tell someone that has gone through a divorce that has shattered their, their life and their family? What do you tell someone that has lost their job after, uh, uh, after being a faithful employee for many years? What do you tell people when they've encountered an obstacle that they've never thought that they would encounter? What do you tell people? Do you tell them what they've done wrong? Do you tell them on, on, on how, what the Bible says regarding doing the right thing? What do you tell them? Beloved, I hope you tell them that the God of Scripture, that the God of the Bible is with them if they're willing to hear from Him. And that God will give them an answer to their prayer. The answer may not be what you think it should be, but the answer will be better than any other response that you may think of. I, while I was talking to this patient at the hospital, my heart sank. I'm an empath. If you've ever heard of an empath, it is when people, when you share your life with an empath, their, your pain becomes their pain. It's, it's like, I, I don't know, I, I connect when people are happy, I'm, I'm happy, but then when people are sad, like it hurts my heart. It's, there's, there's, <laughs> I'm working on it. As a pastor, I encounter a lot of heartbreak, and I have the gray hairs to show you that it gets to me. As this person was talking to me, barely being able to breathe, her body is barely surviving despite autoimmune disease, despite organ failure. God, it's incredible how God built our bodies and how resilient they are. As I was talking to this patient, she was telling me, God, God won't give you more than I can handle, right Edgar? And I thought to myself, do I just start a Bible study and tell them how that idea is wrong? And I said, yeah, but let me tell you, let, let's phrase it in the right terminology. That God will be with us and He will help us. He will give us the strength and His grace in order to overcome whatever obstacle that we encounter. And that one day, we won't have any more broken bodies or messed up or messed up worlds that we live in. But when Jesus returns, our bodies will be restored and we won't have any more heartbreak, no more pain. But until then, that God will give us strength. May we look for Him in our toughest moments in life. Not just in our good times, but in the but in the good times and the bad times, in all times, may we look for the Lord. Do you want to have that experience that, that gives you the strength to, encounter, to overcome any situation? If you, if you desire this, let's have a word of prayer to ask the Lord to come into our lives and to give us the peace that surpasses all understanding and to guide us. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you guide and direct us. I pray that you can give each listener the peace that they need in order to overcome whatever obstacle they are encountering. We pray that you be with our broken world and that you can help us to realize that you're with us even in the hardest moments in our lives. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.